This video is sponsored by Boyke's Biltong. If you're a longtime fan of the team house, you know we love Boyke's Biltong, and you may have heard us eating it live on the show. Biltong is air-dried beef. Think beef jerky, but healthier and better tasting. It's got 32 grams of protein, it's gluten-free, with zero grams of sugar, and it's keto-friendly. You can go with the traditional or the chili if you're feeling crazy, and trust us, it's really hot. So check these guys out by going to boykies.com and using the promo code TEAM15 for 15% off your order. That's boykies, B-O-I-K-E-Y-S dot com, and use the promo code TEAM15 for 15% off your order. Or you can hit the link in the description down below. Thanks, Boykies, for supporting the show, and thank you guys out there for supporting the companies that support us. The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Uh, Marcus Luttrell, you know, was, uh, Afghanistan targeting was, you know, still in its infancy, is still a lot of human base at that point in time in, in Afghanistan, so um, they're really wasn't a great targeting platform to go on as you know we look for you know legacy targets and and plan out some of that stuff and um as far as what the rangers were doing a lot of it we were just on um tst's time sensitive target manning for one platoon and then the other was on uh csar combat search and rescue as a you know basic standard uh ranger taskings at, the, at that point in time and um we had just rotated off of the CSAR tasking onto the time sensitive target tasking. So we had just finished all the, the standups for, you know, running through timelines and, and checks on all that stuff and got the the word that, you know, uh, Mark Latrell's team was, was going to go out and do this um, operation red wings. And, um, you know, as Rangers always do, you know, we get enough information to have a conversation about it at the chow hall table. And so we started talking with some of the recce guys and, you know, they're, you know, they're briefing us because they've been following this a lot closer than like a, a rifle platoon has. It wasn't kind of in our, uh, in our wheelhouse as far as targets we were looking at, but it's stuff that Recky had been looking at in, in areas to do, to do some of their stuff. And they were like, yeah, we wouldn't do it this way. Not four guys. No, we'd take a whole Recky section, you know, 12 guys. And then, but we wouldn't do it without a rifle platoon and support you know, even if it was a, you know, 5k standoff between the two, because they can fight to us and we can fight to them. And it's a bigger footprint on the ground. Yeah. Do we run the risk of spoiling the target? Yes. But, you know, it, on the other side of it, you know, we, it, as Rangers, you know, we're always going to bring everything in the kitchen sink to bear on, on an objective to turn the, the, you know, the, the odds in our favor. And, um, you know, did they do anything wrong the way they did it? No, they they made judgment calls along the way, and you know we can armchair quarterback this, right? You know, years years later and say, well, I wouldn't have done that, and I wouldn't have done this, but you know, they they did what they do, and right. So yeah. you know that led us into you know you know them losing comms and them getting in the fight, and you know as the as the movie portrays it out and. Um, you know, and then we got to go in and and do the combat search and rescue on the turbine three three crash site, and then figure out what the question mark is. Well, what what was team. what was going on in, on your base with your platoon? I mean, are you getting word that this team is compromised? There are guys who are MIA. We might have to go look for them. Then you find out a bird went down. I mean, can you take us through a little bit of that? So, so that morning, so June 28th, that morning, you know, we, we got up and we just did what Rangers do. You know, we got up, did PT, went and ate breakfast, going on with our training cycle. We were going to go out to East River Range, uh, which is just outside of Bagram, the little town of Bagram. So we left the base, got outside there. We're, we're going to go do some shooting drills and, and just, you know, um, have a good session on the range. And we get out there and start throwing the, uh, target stands off the trucks and that's about the time that you know we we find out that the the bird's been shot down and um you know it was, it was hey don't for, don't worry about what you've thrown off the trucks get back on the trucks you know we got to get back and you know, there was a lot of guys who were like what are we doing and you know we didn't have any of the answers at the leadership level of what was going on we just knew that you know we had to be back 
or something that was gonna gonna get briefed you know to us and as the situation was developing and and so then as we were rolling back in you know we find out that the the aircraft has been shot down that team's in the fight and you know we're just on standby at that point and so I wouldn't really kind of understand the whole situation for, you know, probably another six years as I progress through, through leadership. But, you know, as I, as I tell people, it's, it, you know, it's it, as a young guy, you know, it's not that we're not going to get in there and we're not going to be a part of this and we're not going to, but we're going to turn the tables. So that way, when we do recommit forces into this area, we've got so many assets to bear on the objective that it nobody would be in their right mind to want to play. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it was probably, you know, about 10 hours or so, um, a after the initial shoot down that, you know, that night as we're getting ready to, to launch and then, you know, finally got the, the green light that we're going to go and we load up everybody that's going to fit on the aircraft at altitude and, and launch. And then we hit mountain weather, uh, on that night and have to divert infill and, and go sit at Jalabad for a day. And then wait to get infilled the next night. What what was your understanding at that time of the situation on the ground? Um, the so the understanding was that the forty seven had been shot down. There was no movement on that. You know, ISR feeds were terrible at the time. I, you know, don't know. I don't even understand how people could understand. You know what they're seeing on that screen. It was such a bad quality feed even then you know um and so we knew that the aircraft had been shot down we were going in to do combat search and rescue on the crash um you know um murphy's team was still a question mark as to what's going on because there had been no radio comms with them since murphy's sat phone call um so the the priority tasking was to recover the crash because we knew where it was and then after that it would just be to figure it out if you will um so we uh we we interviewed um tony brooks on the show before was he in your platoon uh tony was in one charlie so he was the other half of the okay. the element that went up so it was a uh, uh third platoon led the way because we weren't on the CSAR. So we didn't have all the recovery and crash axes and all the stuff to, to do that. So we, we kind of plowed the way, if you will. And we were there to kind of take the brunt of any contact that was going to be made. Cause we were just there to add security to, to what they were going to come in and do. And as far as recovery, that was, you know, uh, one Charlie's tasking at the time. So that was, that was where Tony was. And, um, okay, uh, cool. You know, yeah, no, it's cool to get like some different perspectives on it. So, so then what was your platoon? You know, I mean, you just explained what your platoon's role was, but then walk us through uh, infill and getting on the ground. So infill, we infilled somewhere about probably about 8,000 feet. And, you know, it was what we could get to with um, the package size that we had uh, on the aircraft. And so there, we knew there wasn't a way to land anywhere up there. So we knew it was going to be a rope and it was going to be at least a minimum a 40 footer. And uh, it ended up 40, and then the, as the rope drifts, you know, it kind of goes 40 to 60 to, uh, <laughs> you know, as as it works out. And then uh, when uh, one Charlie came in, I know their rope started at 60, and it ended up somewhere around yeah. 80. And... Tony said they just roped down into fog with, like, no idea of where the bottom was. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, well, I mean, the fog came in after we were already on the ground. I know what he's talking about because um, – you know, um, it is just the way the weather was working and, um, you know, it's just, it was, it was, you know, one of those points where I, I never really, you know, after a private, I never roped with, with leather gloves, you know, fa fast rope, you know, the working work gloves anymore. I always did it in I mean, Nomex shooting gloves. The hamburger like helper gloves. To, yeah. I never tried like trying to take those gloves off and always felt like my hands got so much hotter and, you know, I had a, uh, team sergeant said hey just just rope in your shooting gloves because you don't have to grip the rope as tight you dissipates the heat just as well and he said just try it on the fast rope tower so i did and that's a, that's a 40 foot rope and you know it wasn't terrible and then i was watching guys carrying 240s and stuff roping in and they've got the big thick gloves on and they're squeezing extra tight just to have a feeling on the rope right 
And so then they're burning in, you know, and their hands are getting so hot that, you know, they're blistering at, you know, still 10 or 15 feet above ground and they're just letting go. They're like, I'll just deal with it when I hit the ground. And, you know, when one Charlie came in, you know, they had the the same problem and guys were falling off and then they were just ending up in a big pile. And I know their RTO had had his uh, arm broken because he got stepped on. Yeah, that's. And so, you know, you got guys that need to get medevac, but. You ain't getting medevaced. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what was it like for your platoon roping in and, and getting on the ground? Uh, it, it wasn't, we didn't have any contact or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it was quiet, you know, and then when you, when the, the brownout cleared and, and all the, you know, the wash of everything and, you know, you kind of look up the mountain, you know, you, you can see the crash because it's still on fire, still burning. And it, it's just kind of one of those, um ominous moments if you will you just kind of you know the gravity of what you're doing has, has finally set in because you're seeing it with your own eyes and not on a tv screen and then it, you know it just becomes the all-night walk uphill through the nettles and you know the scotch burn or not the scotch burn but you know the pines and and all the ground cover that's up there in the mountains and it's just were you guys was there any intelligence that there were enemies on the objective or around the objective we had uh, you know um nais around the area but it wasn't anything like um uh, on on the objective we there wasn't any movement on on there you know throughout the day or or anything and there wasn't there wasn't any you know people coming and going from it um i think you know, looking back at it now as they realized what they had done and what was about to happen. And so they just kind of got a little bit of standoff and they really were, it was to observe, you know, how we were going to take care of it. Yeah. And so, you know, um, as the, the, that day turned into, you know, a week to two weeks, you know, this at night, you know, you see little fires on the mountain and, you know, get eyes on it as best you can. And then AC one thirties dropping, you know, one Oh fives on it. Yeah. So what was that first movement that first night? What was the movement like for you guys? How long did it take? It took all night. It, it, we didn't get to the top until uh, about an hour before, um, you know, sunrise and then we're sitting there on it and then kind of listening to one Charlie, you know, s- suck their way up the mountain. And then uh, one Bravo was still about halfway up the mountain because they had driven in from Jalalabad the night or the morning that it happened. They drove up the 90K in their trucks and then they started walking from the base of the mountain up and they didn't make it until the next day. Yeah. And, you know, only about half the guys that started to climb up the mountain made it up. The rest of them had to go back down and, and get picked up by the the trucks and and you know because they just either heat heat exhaustion or you know s- s- twisted ankles and whatnot yeah yeah and so what did that what was the next like week to what how what did that set in motion for you guys in particular so what it set in motion for us was um you know priority tasking was to accountability and recovery of all you know members of that aircraft crew and then the the qrf team that was on there so that totaled 16 and so we got those numbers you know kind of early afternoon and um there was a small clearing on top of the the mountain you could put a small helicopter like little bird on it but it was um you know cds drops for demolitions and uh you know basically had to create an hlz to be able to get everybody off that mountain that you know the remains for those guys. And so, um, it was kind of, a was a, a good distraction, if you will, to do timber charges and, and clear that space to, to be able to make enough room to bring, you know, a helicopter in. And, and so, um, we just finished our regimental breachers course. And, uh, so all that, old stuff you know that that timber stuff was still fresh in everybody's mind so it was uh you know we're all sitting there trying to do the math and the first sergeants are like use the p method <laughs> yeah so we're 
sending tree stumps and everything up, you know, like Roman candles. It was, you know, just pack as much explosives in these little burrow holes underneath and launch it. And yeah. uh, so that that was fun. We cleared that and then we got to tasking for um, you know, what would turn out to be go down the mountain and and find Marcus. Um and so that that started the fun of the mountain weather moved in that night and dumped on us and we're trying to walk downhill and you know the trails a little stream bed at the time and so guys are slipping and falling and guys are trying to not fall off the the ridge and then we end up uh just for safety reasons you know we end up spending the last few hours kind of huddled under pine trees waiting for the sun to come up so that we don't lose anybody how many guys did you have left in your platoon at this point uh we had split the four so we had two two squads in the pl's package so you know the platoon leader rto fo were with us and then the platoon sergeant had his you know uh one squad two machine guns you know on on, still on the top and on the on the top of the mountain and um close to the crash site we, we knew what we were yeah, they were still up there with with one Charlie and and reinforcing them, and we're just kind of the uh, the maneuver element, if you will, um, going down and trying to confirm or deny what the, this uh, push to talk signal was that that we were getting mm-hmm. uh, being triangulated down into this. I I always forget the name of the village, so I can't ever remember it. So you I guys, had to, you guys had to kind of like hide at, hide out, not hide out, but you know take cover under the pine trees until dawn. And then continue to move down to where this, you know, ostensibly there is a SIGINT hit that you had to go investigate. Right. And so that was basically confirm or deny, um, you know, was it enemy recovered American equipment or was it actually, in fact, you know, uh, Murphy's team or, you know, what, what the question mark was still for that. And that was kind of where we were at for the tasking, you know, it was, the, the crash had been accounted for so now we're just trying to figure out you know the fate of you know this four man seal team and so um you it, know it, finally pushed down in there was it a consistent with, uh, with, signal with, that you guys were going off of or was uh, it just like a single a couple of hits and they're like okay around this general area um no it was it wasn't like a consistent but you know it was like somebody just keying the keying the push to talk you know, intermittently enough to get a, you know, an orbital transmission to triangulate, uh, you know, where it was. And um, so it was kind of confirm or deny what that was. And mm-hmm. So, you know, there was an SF team that was walking up that we tied in with okay. and uh, and pushed back down into this, this little uh, village. And then, um, you know, as we're doing the Ranger smash through all the doors and clearing the village, you know, here comes Marcus, you know, from up from where they had him hidden and kind of stashed and so um you know confirm that and then start you know doing the so so they actually uh, brought marcus out to to meet you guys right they knew why we were there they knew what we were looking for and so it was to you know hand him over and then do the you know the kind of the whole sf thing where they do the you know let's drink some tea and talk and you know well, what so what was that moment us, like? What as, was that moment like when you first got face to face with Marcus and confirmed this guy's alive? And what what was your your perception of all that? Um, I don't know. The big question, you know, that we you know the first thing that we asked was once you know we went through the whole challenge and and kind of confirmed that it is him. You know, through the whole you know MI POW MIA cards that yeah, yeah. you know we all fill out and going through that. It was you know, dude, where's everybody else? You know, and then, uh, you know, he's like, they're dead. Well, okay, great. Not great, but, you know, it's like, okay, but where? They're on the mountain. That's it. You know, it's kind of that, uh, you can't give me anything more. The CEO has just started kind of a, a frustration thing, and I get it. You know, he's been... You know, that wasn't that probably wouldn't have been fun to come down that mountain the way he says he came down that mountain. Um, but you know, I I would like to hope to think that you know, if my friends were dead on that mountain, I could at least remember some kind of terrain feature that I could at least tell somebody that they're you know, they're up here in this area. And so, what, what was the next step after that initial you had that initial questioning 
uh, of Marcus, uh, what what happened next? So the, what happened next was, you know, we just kind of secured the little village that we were at and, uh, you know, confirmed that it was him, passed up, you know, over sap that, you know, we had him and then we were in control of him. And then we just had to sit and wait for nightfall to come so that we could bring in the medevac bird and, and get him out. And then it just started, you know, um, days and days and days of sweeping and searching this mountainside. For the rest of the team. For the rest of the team. Uh, I mean, did you guys eventually find, find the, the remains of those uh, three other guys? Yeah, we exfilled Marcus, and then the next day, you know, we were sweeping the lower portion of this of this um, spur, and uh, the other half of our platoon was coming from the top of the ridge down, and we were just kind of meeting in the middle. And so after we had met in the middle and, you know, kind of, traded information and they got a break um you know they started to climb back up for the night and we turned around and started coming back down to to finish our suite they stumbled on on two of the remains just by happenstance somebody lost their footing and slipped into a little wash and and ended up you know face first with with two of them oh man that's rough and so <laughs> well the rough part was is they still had to go like 800 meters vertically with you know two two sets of remains and all we have is the old school uh poncho method to to carry them up right uh because you couldn't do it with a litter so it was wrapping them up in the poncho and and kind of getting them up as best as possible and you know then they had to carry it traverse them across the ridge back over to the the hlz and um you know then it, it it, that was the hard part is after that now we're just looking for one person mm -hmm. right and you know we ended up searching for oh man oh, well, probably another 10 days before we got ripped out when 375 came in yeah and and, and you know I, at that point you know we're, we're we're 14 days 12 or 12 days into this whole thing and it's guys are just gassed yeah and I remember Tony saying that, I mean, the weather, you guys weren't getting enough water, that it, it was just, it, it was just nonstop for you guys. Yeah, it was, you know, from sun up to sundown, you know, and then you got to, you know, we're pulling security and small elements. And so you're not getting much sleep and guys are getting sick with, you know dehydration stuff or guys are getting, you know, you know what happens when you, you get a bad MRE and then you got a little bit of food poisoning or whatever. And, and work doesn't stop. You just got to keep going. Yeah. Even though you've got a little bit of food poisoning from an MRE that may have spoiled and you ate it anyway. And yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so you guys get ripped out before you find the, uh, the final body. Yeah. And then, but it, well, we got ripped out, and then uh, so I want to say it was probably eight hours later, you know, that three seven five had had found the uh, the the last one, and so uh, it was. We were happy that we were upset that you know we didn't end up finding him, you know, because somebody else had to come in. But you know, we we're glad it was over with. Right. Right. Well, you said the, you mentioned earlier on that, you know, there were things that you pieced together years after uh, the event, because at the time, you know, you're a, you're a, a sergeant. You're, you know, yeah.